Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Wally Bach. And Grace Under Pressure is a show that deals with things that are too often dismissed as the soft, soft stuff, the caring, the commitment uh, we care for others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover, uh, Wally is, we do it to bring people together and we catalyze them with our energy and positive thoughts and actions. So welcome, Wally uh, Bach. It is an honor to have you on the show. So, And it's an honor to have been asked. Thank you. Thank you. I have to tell you, folks, I have known of Wally for, oh, ever since I've been on Twitter, which is more than 10 years. And Wally has been kind and gracious enough to tweet, retweet my stuff. So I owe him a big thank you. And I thank you for that. But uh, Wally uh, sent me his bio, which was a lot, one paragraph. He said, I'm a blogger, a ghostwriter and a writing coach, which we will talk about. Um, and But he also writes his own blog, which is the three star blog and some 1000 entries. Um, and he's written many, many books, and um, and I will tell you all about it. But the backstory to Wally is um, he's got he's experienced in business um, and done some pretty incredible things. So as a writer, he has a depth to him that most of us who engage in this simply do not have. So uh, Wally Bach, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So. Happy to be here. Waiting Great. to be steward. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, well, what I, we've been having fun on, because I refer to Wally as the leadership sage of the South, because he's based in South Carolina. And uh, so Wally recently noted, uh, and I have forgotten, this was a year or so ago, he had 50 years of leadership experience. So uh, what have you learned in 50 years, Wally? <laughs> I've learned, it, I've learned it's, a, it's a tough gig. <laughs> I mean, really, the most the most important thing is I have been doing it and studying it and researching it for more than 50 years since I got out of the Marines in 1968. That's and great. And I that's when a day goes by that I don't read something or hear something or try something that's that's new. And you spark some of them so you can take full blame. OK, well, it's interesting. You mentioned that you are a, served in the Marine Corps. And so what is there a leadership lesson or lessons that that was inculcated in you that lives on today? So, yeah, there's one. And, and people who read my stuff will say, oh, yeah, that's where he got that. <laughs> um, Marines basically say that if you're a leader, you have two jobs. One of those jobs is to accomplish the mission, whatever that mission happens to be, through the group. In other words, not do it yourself. The second job is to care for your people. And that is a, a part that's left out of a lot of the corporate leadership that I've experienced and seen. And it's also the part that makes great teams, uh, great companies, you look at Southwest, when, uh, particularly when Herb Kelleher was still alive, what energized that, that company and kept it true to the values weren't the you know, great strategies and you know, crisp thinking. It was Herb you know, drinking his wild turkey every day. And <laughs> I'm, glad you mentioned, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, well, that's the thing about, you know, there's lots of uh, stories about Herb, but I mean, he um, and Wild Turkey, um, but he loved what he did and people loved him because he he met and mingled with them in an extraordinary way. And he also kept his ears open and built a business around the people. And that's what you're talking about. So that's it. And that's if there's one lesson, universal lesson for leadership out of my marine experience, that's it. You've got two jobs, and they're both important. And sometimes you trade off one for the other. But over and you the have time, you have a rich corporate or organizational background. Um, you were an, a leadership executive. Excuse me. You were an executive, uh, business development. Uh, you, you told me that you had uh, wor once worked for a seminary where your team eradicated the debt, which is a major heavy lift. Um, you uh, worked. You were uh, built a specialty publishing firm, and I know I'm missing some other things. So you have street cred, my friend. So. 
Well, I'll tell you what, what some of the best experience has been for me is that for about 15 years, I made a good deal of my money by going out and giving speeches to associations, trade associations and companies. And that was an incredible experience for me. And it really plays into what I do today because I learned, first of all, I learned there's romance about everything, whether you're talking about pedorthic footwear or saving the whales, there's romance in there someplace. And the people who do it well resonate with what, whatever that is and however that helps. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, I, I'm going to put you on the spot there for a minute because a coll- I remember years ago when I was contemplating a career change, I started in corporate communications and speech writer and did things. And I was asking one of my clients about um, leadership speeches or whatever. And I said, I said, what is it? And he goes, well, you, you just got to be able to tell some good stories. And so um, storytelling is essential to effective leadership communication. Would you not agree? Uh, Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. It's also, uh, by the way, key to any great business book. It's one of the reasons why yours are so good, is that you wrap them in there. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail, my friend. Thank you. So, <laughs> well, I always think that we learn more from stories, certainly as adults, because they're kind of, um, we see ourselves in them. Do you think that's part of it, uh, Wally? So, Well, I think stories are the way that human beings have communicated since we crawled out of caves. And what a story does is it puts an awful lot of stuff in a confined and memorable space. My dad used to say, my dad was a Lutheran preacher, and one of the things that he was known for was when he was very young, he started using stories from the pulpit, which was not the characteristic of the time. Ah. to be a kind of theologian in residence and, you know lay out kierkegaard for the kids you know. <laughs> kierkegaard dad, for the kids that's a term i haven't heard but that's a good one yeah but dad started using stories and started studying them and started giving seminars uh on them early on right and i just i just took that you can put a lot of stuff in there but at one point he said you know, he said, you can make a lot of great points, but at the end of the day, what they're going to remember is that story about the Indian and his dog. And that's true. This, it's, it's the story that, that carries the load. So you've got to make sure it works when you use right. it. Right. And I find, sto- I find so much of my leadership, in, <clears throat> excuse me, inspiration comes from stories um, uh, of people that I follow, admire, either from history or day to day leadership. And there are stories all around us. So uh, we just have to pay attention. So, so. <laughs> good. Um, you, um, I, I, so you've had a successful corporate career. What prompted you to want to write about it and go in a, a new direction? So, well, it wasn't a new direction at first. At, at first, I'd been in the Marines. I got out of the Marines. I had a kind of interim job that kept me eating until I got a job as a management trainee with a multinational company. And what they did is they put me in a, I was in a warehouse, uh, also in Ohio, by the way, in Cleveland. And one of my jobs as the assistant manager was to give this bad feedback to one of our guys in the warehouse, who was A, probably twice my age, and B, certainly twice my size. And so I, you know, read up on what you're supposed to do. And I brought him into my office, he sat down, and I started doing what I thought was just the absolute right thing to do until he (laughs) stood up and slammed his fist, which was about the size of my head, (laughs) on my desk, screamed some obscenities at me, went out the door, slammed it, knocked a picture off the wall when he did that. And I sat there and thought, you know, next to being shot at, that could be the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I what, I, what I realized was that an awful lot of what I had been learning, and I didn't have to learn it in the Marines. Marines had a nice structure for how you handle that stuff. Didn't have to learn it there. But once I got out, 
most, uh, not most, but a lot of the stuff that I was being told was, was simply wrong. And so I said, okay, I want to do this better. And I want to tell people about it because I'm my father's son and I'm the nephew of my three storytelling uncles. And by God, if there's a story in it, we're going to do it. Yeah. So I started researching. Uh, I started writing. I was writing my first articles while I was still employed uh, by the by the multinational. Yeah. Uh, which was a way long time ago. Yeah. But well, that's, that's really where it started, what, and that's been, yeah, a, that's that's been a passion. Yeah. That what a fascinating background. So, um, so you build that. So then you decide, and you you do write in your own voice, but you are. Um, a ghostwriter and a prolific one. So what prompted you to become a ghostwriter? So 9-11. Here's the story. I was still in the major, speaking was still a major part of what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And so pretty soon after 9-11, when they opened the skies up again, I was supposed to go to Pierre, South Dakota to give a speech. Mm -hmm. Living in Wilmington, North Carolina at the time. So that meant I would drive an hour and a half to the Raleigh Durham Airport, get on a plane, go to Minnesota, to Minneapolis, which is a great airport, yeah. catch my flight to Pier. I'd get in about two in the afternoon, which was good because they were calling for a blizzard, which I think happens every other day. <laughs> it could be, yeah. yeah. So I went up to, to RDU and I went to the checkpoint. I sat down and there were two guys. This was in the era after 9-11, but before TSA. So they had more trainees there. The two guys who were on post that day and had passed me through, the most senior of them had two weeks experience. And they decided that I had a little uh, money clip in the shape of a badge from Metro-Dade Police Department, who had been yeah. one of our clients. They decided I was impersonating a police officer, and they knew the terrorists did that. And so they pulled me off the plane. And they called, then they called for, for the real cops. <laughs> Meanwhile, my plane takes off, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Yeah. This lieutenant from RD, from the Raleigh police shows up. She thought it was the funniest thing she heard in years. <laughs> yeah. And I wound up, uh, long story short, I got into pier at 2 in the morning in a snowstorm instead of 2 in the yeah. afternoon in sunshine. Yeah. And I realized that for me, after 9-11, that I didn't travel wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. I would yeah. put up for it because I really liked what I was doing, yeah. but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I thought about a couple of different things and talked to a couple of friends of mine who also were ghostwriters or, or were ghostwriters mm -hmm. and went from there. But it was, I was coming off the road. I needed something to do. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah. Well, I, I always wonder about ghosts. I, mean, I used to be a speechwriter, so that is a form of ghostwriting. And, and the, the problem is, is in the, in the, the metaphor I use or I stole is that um, I was challenged to write about leadership uh, by senior executives because um, and so I started researching it and uh, went back to graduate school and things like that. And I had all these great ideas. And then I would hear an executive say those things on stage. And I said, hey, wait a minute. I want to be saying those things. <laughs> so, so my ego got in the way. So I, and, and Wally, you've sort of not done what I've done, but I figured that if you're going to cross the Rubicon, uh, you know, I did it and there's no going back because ghostwriters are anonymous and I didn't want to be anonymous. So, uh, but you've balanced it because you have a voice and you're a public voice, but you also ghosts. How do you find the balance? So, well, I need to tell you another story. Up until about 1996, everything that I wrote was my own. I wrote, the books were mine. We, I used a couple of pseudonyms, but they were mine. 1996, I was having a conversation with a fellow named Jeff Sine, who was a friend of mine from the speaking world. And we were talking about this new thing called the Internet. And, you know, Jeff wanted to know if I knew a book that business leaders could read. Mm 
that he could recommend to his clients. And I said, no. And by the time that afternoon was done, we just had to be as well write this song. <laughs> so, so the result was Cyber Power for Business, which Inc. Magazine called a book every CEO should own. How, how's that for, for yeah. Like, I don't uh, know. That's not a bad way to start out as a published author or what? I mean, you were already published. But, I was already I mean, published, but yeah. But the other thing that happened was that I learned I really like working with somebody on a book. I like writing alone myself, too, but <clears throat> there was something about, <clears throat> excuse me, yep. something about working with someone uh, and that back and forth and the expertise that he or she had that I didn't have. And that was the other thing that fed into my, my ghostwriting thing. Ah, uh, so you really look- like I learned from every book project. Oh, okay. So you, so you view or you operate as ghostwriting as a collaborative exercise, correct? So yeah, there are there are different types of ghostwriters. Mm-hmm. The classic uh, ghostwriter that people think of is the fellow who walks in, takes all your papers, takes all your audio files, walks out, writes a book, and comes back. And I have a good friend who does exactly that. Yeah, that's fine. That's not me. Yeah, I'm collaborative. I tend to call myself a writing partner to, to ah. kind of go around the, uh, the ghostwriting thing. But it's, for me, it's, I love to write. I love wrestling those angels of meaning onto the page. Mm-hmm. And I love to learn. And I'm, I'm working with mid-career professionals who are experts in, in their field. Yeah. And so every book is a learning experience. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, um, well, uh, speaking of that, so when you put down the thoughts, um, how do you find the voice of the author if it's not you? So, Well, you don't want too much of a voice in a, in a business book. Mostly what you want is, is readable prose. Is, is mm-hmm. week or, or, you know, maybe if you're really good, John Baldoni quality stuff. <laughs> oh, that check is coming, Wally. <laughs> but you do want to get some things in there that make it, oh, that sounds like somebody I know. I know Rod. That's what he sounds like. I know Terry. That's what he yeah. would say. And it turns out that everybody I work with has got some distinctive thing about the way they talk. And we, yes. do a, we do a lot of talking and recording uh, interviews so that I can get it right. But if I get that in there occasionally, my Rod Santomasimo has been a client of mine for three books now. And I know that Rod has one of those things where he, he makes a point and then he pauses and he says yes and makes the point again. Now, all I need to do is put that in a chapter and somebody who knows Rod will say, oh, yeah, Rod does that all the time. He does it on stage, he does it on podcast. Yeah. It's, that, it's, it's getting the essence of that. The other thing mm-hmm. is that all of my clients have their unique way of phrasing what they're expert in. And so using those terms, I mean, it's, it's not like a talent for mimicry. It's this is the way he talks about it. Okay. That, and that pretty much does the trick. If you try to do too much of that, and I've made that mistake. If you try to do too much of that, what happens is that the book becomes a caricature in, instead of a helpful document. Ah, interesting. Um, Wally, because there's a question I get from colleagues in my business who want to write a book. So who should use a ghostwriter? What's your perspective on that? So, Well, I think, I think like, again, it depends on what kind of ghostwriter you need. If, if you want somebody to, to come and, and write your book from your stuff, that's not me. Yeah. From my perspective, the person who needs me is someone who, A, has built up some expertise. Not everyone one has. So I don't have any clients that are below 40. Yeah. And they've got, and they've got to have some, some heft to it. There's an awful lot of people who know an awful lot of quotations they got from Brainy Quote, but that doesn't make them an expert in anything. Sure. Okay. And for using me, that's the best thing. A mid-career okay. expert and also able to write the book themselves. Because if they, I believe that anybody who can read a book can write a book pretty much. Okay. You, it, yeah, it's more work and it's polish and, and so forth. 
But yeah, if you can, you can get it out. The other thing, though, that, that's important that I ask every prospective client I, is I ask them if they have a coach or have had a coach. And I will not work with people who haven't been coached. And when you say coach, do you mean an executive coach or a writing coach? Any kind of coach. I don't, I don't care if it's physical. Have you worked with somebody who helped you do something better? That's an interesting... Not, that's a, yeah. Why, I can't work with you. Why, why do you say that? I, that's an interesting insight, and I'd like to know why you have that as a prerequisite. So. Well, after 10 years, I went through my client and I looked at all the people I'd worked with successfully, and I looked at the few failed projects I had. All, most all, except for maybe one or two of the successful ones, had coaches or were coaches, but they were familiar with the, the whole process. None of the failed ones had a coach. And when I then looked next layer down, I looked at where the problem was. The problem very often was that they didn't want to learn. What they wanted to do was direct me. And that's okay for some people, but not okay for me. That's not what I bring to the table. Right. Okay. Um, stepping back from that, you've been uh, reflecting on leadership, uh, practicing leadership, helping others express themselves in leadership, and sharing your wisdom for 50 years. So... What in your what what's changed over that 50 years, Wally? Yeah. 50 years ago, um, the term is used as command and control, which I don't like because it, it misstates something else. But it was the idea of the boss was in charge. If you were a supervisor, first line supervisor, your job was to make sure that people did things right, catch them when they did things wrong and help them do better. Yeah. And it, 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 along, along that was um, the only time you heard feedback, a term not used, was if you screwed up. Am I correct? Right. <laughs> yeah. And nobody used a coach ever. Yeah. I, used to, I used to coach because I had to do some negotiations with a Japanese firm. And I started out and it, it just it, they were making me crazy. I mean, they were doing stuff I didn't understand. And so I went over to NYU. I was based in New York. And I found a guy that did international uh, business, I guess, and caught up that. And so I asked him for help, and he gave me a couple of sessions. Well, yeah. gosh, when my boss found out about it, he you better not let anybody know about that. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Interesting. Oh, yes. It's like, you're, it's like you, you, you're supposed to be born with all of this knowledge. True. So true. And, and, and coaching. Thing. Another thing was, here, see this? Yeah. Okay. I grew it because when I got out of the Marines, I looked like I was 12. I, I <laughs> it yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Well, I, in one of my first corporate meetings, I was the only one with facial hair. Wow. And this giant ex heavyweight boxer sales manager came up to me and pulled at my mustache. And I slapped his hand and we kind of went back and forth from there. It all, in the end, it, it turned out good. But as far as I know, for the entire time I was there, I was the only person with a mustache. Yeah. So. And it, it was all, we all dressed the same. We looked the same. We faced the same way. It was almost like being back in the Marines in that sense. <laughs> girl, we're all going to go left. So if you got the mustache. Oh, that's yeah, funny. That's, that's a good one. Well, what I've seen, it, it, you know, change, uh, people would ask me what's changed. And I would always be kind of a flippant answer for fun. And I'd say absolutely nothing, you know, since the time is we were, you know, a tribal. You know, but I've noticed that actually, and I've said this sometimes, that when I remember in high school, I went to Jesuit high school, I don't recall ever honestly hearing the word leadership, maybe leader, but it was a few, uh, a refer reference to a historical figure or something like that. But what I did learn was the practice of leadership 
and perspective. And so leadership as we know it in a way is a kind of a, a new thing. Uh, would you not agree, Wally? So, well, I mean, the way we speak fact, about it. You can answer that a couple of different ways. You can go back yeah. and say, well, you have the Ohio State leadership studies, which were like 1947, 48, mm -hmm. which was a lot longer than that. But you didn't have any books about leadership, really, that you saw. You had books about individual people. And then in 1978, you had James McGregor Burns' book, Leadership, right. which uh, was fascinating and wrong in so many ways that I think. <laughs> yeah. But it set up the whole thing where leader changed from being a noun, John's a leader. Okay, I know what, what that means. It means that John has followers and they're trying to do something together. Now, all of a sudden, you're talking about Burns says, no, 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 no. Hitler couldn't have been a leader because he wasn't moral. Oh, so now it's a test. So now when somebody tells me somebody is a leader, it's an authentic leader or a great leader or whatever. Yes. It's, it's not a noun anymore. It's an adjective. Exactly. Now, I don't know what he, me, he or she means by that. And that's that's definitely a change from Hitler. We didn't right. talk about leadership, but we damn sure knew who leaders were. <laughs> that's that's good, and you experienced them. So uh, and that yeah. and you knew the good ones. Yeah, and I so had, I had two magnificent commanding officers in the Marine Corps, and right. they're still models for me. Now I've had One, other people since, but not that. That's great. Um, Wally, sadly, we are coming close to the end of our show. So, I, I, you know, I ask everyone a story of grace. Do you have one that you want to share as the son of a Lutheran minister? <laughs> I, I think I, I told you uh, earlier, John, that as a, as a son of a Lutheran minister, grace for me starts biblically. It's in Ephesians, by grace you're saved through faith and not mm -hmm. in yourself. You can get to yeah. God. So for me, grace has always been an unmerited benefit. And I live my life showered in grace. I mean, people who've helped parents, uh, friends, mentors. But recently, um, we moved here because my wife was caring first for her mother and then for her father. Mm -hmm. And we'd always talked about moving this is her hometown yeah and after mama died after my mother-in-law died yeah. we were here and jim my father-in-law was here and we had dinner every week and we saw him three or four times a week otherwise and jim was a very successful but very wise and exceptional exceptionally caring human being who did an awful lot of good that nobody ever heard of, but who also was a, a manager, uh, created the, uh, overseas is not the word I want, but the international division in his company was the CEO of that. At his funeral, I had a guy come up to me and say, you know, I would, fo would follow Jim anywhere because he always wrote me notes. And I... <laughs> I've got every one of them. Huh. I got two years of seeing Jim McGee talking about leadership and life and ethics and faith and all the, all that stuff. That such a blessing. I you know talk about unmerited. Yeah. Well, well, that the, <laughs> well, that yeah. What what a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, and you know, your father-in-law lived definitely practiced grace. Um, you know, and uh, I can just Im I have that image of the funeral and people uh, how he uh, coming to that that he touched them in ways that. You know, you didn't know, but he never sought uh, credit for that. He just he was. Yeah. This is what his job was. This is what he did. I'll tell you what's funny. You know, the, David Brooks talks about the eulogy virtues and the resume mm -hmm. virtues. Right. Nobody at that funeral or afterwards said a thing about what a successful business person he was or anything. It was stories about the notes, stories about the time. We, we talk, 
the, the guy who comes here and does our, our plumbing and, and electricity, uh, Jim wrote him a note every time he went. He'd send him <laughs> wow. a check and he'd write him a note about what he liked about what was done. Yeah. Um, and people would come up and say, you, you know, you may not have heard. And usually I hadn't because he never talked about it. Right. But it was, yeah, he was, he was an amazing guy. And yeah. getting right. that, that two years of like tutoring was really special. Wow. Well, Wally, thank you. And I will say you are, my friend, are a man of grace. So um, I appreciate you spending time with me. And uh, Wally, how can people find you? Because I want to put it in the notes uh, for the show. So, Well, there's a couple of ways. There is the blog, which is at threestarleadership.com. That's T-H-R-E-E-L-E-A-D-E-R-S-H-I-P. All is one word, dot com. There's a little tag for blog. You can go there. I also do a writing blog, and that is, this is this is tough, writingabookwithwally.com. <laughs> writingabookwithwally.com. Wow. One word, com. You saved the best for last, Wally, that creative inspiration. <laughs> Wally, it's been a pleasure, and with that, we're going to close out. Thank you. So. Well, thank you. It's been great, uh, even more fun than I anticipated. Thank you. All right.